as you get older, it gets harder and harder to stay in touch with your family. Luckily, some family members do what they can to keep in contact with you, but is that always for the best? Author Code V shows us the worst that can happen when grandma starts missing you. After a tiresome day at work, I was leaned back on my cheap couch with the TV remote in my hand as I absentmindedly browsed through the channels. I guess I had no intention of actually watching TV at all. Rather, I just wanted to waste some time until my dinner is finished cooking inside the microwave, the leftover steak from the previous day. I'm sure you can tell at this point that I'm a lower class being in the society. I never got to finish college, I work at a factory, which apparently doesn't pay much. And to add up to my misery, I'm also single, despite being 25 years old. Anyway, it was right around when I was browsing through the cartoon channels on my small television screen above a flat wooden table, my doorbell rang. Putting the remote down, I got up to answer it. It was the mailman holding a medium-sized package. After bringing that package inside, I had a bright smile on my face as I realized it was from my grandma, the only woman in my life that's still alive. I opened it hastily and saw a cute stuffed caterpillar toy, which was random. <laughs> but I didn't look too much into it, as the rest of my attention was on the letter on top of it. I took out that letter, along with the toy which was nicely made, and had some kind of solid object inside among the regular cotton stuffing. Placing it beside my TV on the table, I proceeded to read the letter. It basically said she took some time to get used to her new hobby and made the first doll for me. That same pleasant smile washed over my face. The next day, I got back from work again, a little early this time. Once again, I leaned back on my couch with the TV remote browsing the channels. The doorbell once again rang just as I switched to a news channel. It was, once again, the mailman with a similar package from my grandma. And this time it was a spherical toy with a smiley face. Just like the caterpillar, this one also had something solid inside along with the stuffing. I walked over towards the television to place the toy beside the caterpillar. Also, this time, there was no letter, which I didn't find odd, at least not compared to the strange blood stain I noticed on the bottom of the doll which I was holding. But before I could even give it some thought, my attention was stolen by the television screen in front of me. It was my grandma's house being broadcasted live, and I only saw that one word in the headlines that made my heart pound. Homicide. The suspect has apparently been staying in the victim's house for the past two days, said the female reporter. And it's too graphic for us to show on a live broadcast. But it appears that the victim's left arm and her head have not only been severed, but they're also missing. My stomach turned as my eyes moved to the arm-like caterpillar doll on the table and to the face-like smiley doll on my hand. Do you believe in monsters? I do. I've got one under my bed. But before you ask me why I'm forcing my neighbor to sleep under my bed, I think you should get a load of these stories. What you're about to see and hear are five allegedly true stories from people like you who claim to have seen real-life monsters, all of which have been drawn to life so that you can live the experience yourself. Now lock the doors, shut the windows, and settle in. Because there's something just outside, and it's waiting for you. The Thing in the Reeds by Spencer S. I was about 12 years old at the time. I had just taken up photography. I live in a small town in Wisconsin that has a public campground just outside the limits, and I had been looking for a spot for a unique photo opportunity. But little did I know 
what I was getting myself into. One day that summer, I had been riding my bike for a few miles before I remembered that the campground had a small lake. I thought that I could make it there and back home before dark. I reached the entrance to the campground right before sunset, and I was in a hurry to take my photos and get home before it got dark. As I made my way down the pier toward the lake, I began to notice that the sounds of the wildlife around me had gone completely and eerily silent. That was when I smelled it, a foul combination of smells, like spoiled meat, rotten fruit, just decay. As I began to look around, I heard splashing and movement to my left. As I turned to look in the direction of the sounds, I saw a tall figure, about eight feet tall, watching me from above the reeds. I was locked in its gaze for what felt like hours, but it must have only been a few minutes. After the figure turned away and began to walk away from me, I was so horrified at what I had just seen. I hopped onto my bike, and I sped out of there as fast as I could. To this day, no one knows of my encounter. My friends and family are skeptics, and I don't have the courage to tell them, because I know they wouldn't believe me. It Attacked Us by Bobcat73 I was 10 years old. My family and I moved houses after my dad got a job offer. I had to leave my old neighborhood, leave along my old friends, and my sister and I had to get used to things all over again. One day, we were quite bored, so we decided to take a hike and explore through the new woods around our place. Now, behind our house, that's where the forest is most dense, and you could hear a stream running through it. We had been walking about an hour when we heard a snap in the nearby bushes, which freaked out my little sister. She had always been one of those jumpy types of people, but I was stubborn, so we carried on. It was about five minutes after we heard the snap in the bushes, when all around us, nature went silent. It felt like we were being watched. Cliché, I know, but it felt like there wasn't just the two of us. There was something out there staring right at us. Then, the forest silence was suddenly broken by a strange yowl, like a screeching cat, but more drawn out and much, much deeper. It was followed by the distressed call from a deer, and then utter silence. The call was about 100 yards away from us, so we bolted, but whatever it was, was gaining on us. And in my panic, I pushed my sister into a thorn bush, and I followed after, too shocked to feel the pain. We held each other tightly, and then we heard a deep growl to the right of us. Slowly, we turned to look, bracing ourselves to come face to face with this beast. But when we looked, there was nothing there. But then the stench hit us, a stench like sulfur, bodily waste, and copper. Then we heard a scratching sound above us, and we snapped our heads up to look at it. And what we saw would scar us for the rest of our lives. What we saw was a creature with a body shape similar to that of a panther, but light gray with a black stripe down its spine. The head was more akin to a boar, but its feet, they were like a dog's paws, but it did not have a tail. Its eyes were a misty blue, like it was blind or something. But then, it snapped its head to look at us, and, I swear, it smiled. 
It was nothing a human being should ever have to see. It had teeth like razors, and there seemed to be red fluid dripping from its yellowish fangs. We ran, and we did not look back, not even as the branches began snapping, and the growls and grunts of this creature echoed. When we got to the edge of our property, the paw steps faded away. We ran to our front door, opened it, and slammed it shut before passing out from exhaustion and terror on the couch. My sister and I still talk about this incident, and each time we bring it up, the same spark of fear blazes in her eyes. Black Holes and an Open Mouth by Fabian. It was a late evening in Iceberg, Sweden. Me, Greta, Haldor, and my sister Miriam were outside. The two girls were playing with the dog, while Haldor and I were making spears out of wood and sticks, pretending to be survivalists. It was a lot of fun. But the thing none of us knew at the time was that this was going to be the most horrible day of our lives. All of a sudden, a very strange noise began to erupt from our left. Almost in unison, we turned our heads, and what we saw is extremely hard to describe, but I'll try my best. A tall figure, almost four feet above my head, with a human-like body, except that it was covered in thick black hair, was standing there, and it was staring at us. The way it looked, it made me tremble. It had two black holes where the eyes should have been, and an open mouth with teeth that looked strong enough to crush bone. My cousin, who had been making another spear before we saw it, but now he was on the ground trembling like I was. Then he began to scream. I tried to calm him down, but he was in shock. So I told my sister and Greta to go inside quickly and take the dog with them. Finally, I was able to calm Haldor. I helped him to his feet and we took a look back at the creature. It was coming right towards us. I had hoped that Haldor's scream would have scared it away, but instead, it wanted to get closer. The creature was maybe 12 feet away from us now. As I panicked and backed away, the creature stopped and just stood there again, staring. What did it want from us? Was it going to attack, or was it just watching? We began to move more quickly backwards, as the figure stood there, not even moving a muscle, though its eyes, those dark black holes, were enough to drive anyone mad if you stared at them too long. I whispered in Haldor's ear, we have to run, we need to go now. He tried his best to nod, but with the way he was shaking, it was more like a tick. Then, we ran for our lives, ran as fast as we could back inside, and swiftly ran over to the window. Once there, we took a look outside. There still stood the beast, still staring at us through the window. For the longest time, we simply stared at each other. I was waiting for it to leave, but who knows what it had in mind. Eventually, it turned around and slowly walked back into the woods. There's not much more to say to this. I never did see the thing again, except for in my nightmares. But there's one thing I can say for certain. I'll never forget its face. The Creeping Creature from the Forest by Michael J. It was the middle of spring in 2016. I was 15 years old then. I was at home with my brother, both of us quite bored, so I told him that I was going to go out for a few hours, and he simply nodded. I went outside, and I began to walk down the streets. 
Nothing special, just a typical walk. Something I didn't even do that often. Usually when I do, it's to hang out with friends. But on this day, I was walking alone. I got to the point where I was more bored then than I was at home. And so I thought, why not go to the nearby forest? Perhaps that would be a bit more interesting. I looked up on Google Maps any nearby forest trails, and I found one only a few meters away from where I was. Bizarrely, much more closer than I expected. I found the trail in no time, and I began to walk along it. There weren't any other people out and about that day, just me and the forest. I had been walking on that trail for about 10 minutes, saw some small animals like raccoons and some insects. I was beginning to think this was better than staying at home and that I should come out more often. That was until I saw it. I walked past something odd, a shining object. I quickly turned to see what it was, but there was nothing there. Strange. I kept on walking, but soon I saw the same sort of glint out of my peripheral vision. But when I turned once more, I finally saw what was causing it. Eyes. Eyes coming from the most bizarre and disturbing animal I'd ever seen. It was like a creep. A creature, a human, with horns and rotten-looking claws. I saw it, crouching on the ground, leaning forward and feasting upon something, but I couldn't tell what. Normally, when I saw something like this, I would just run. But just as I was thinking about what to do, the creature noticed me. It turned so quickly in my direction, I jumped. It was now staring and looking at me, like looking into my soul. I ran all the way home, never looking back. My ears perked, waiting for the dreadful sound that told me it was pursuing me. Luckily, I never heard it. I got home, opened the door, and locked it behind me. My brother was staring at me with a strange look and said, Are you okay, dude? Without looking at him, I answered, uh, I'm fine. That night, I was in bed, and I woke up at around 4.34. It was still completely dark outside, not yet close enough to morning for the sun to rise. I rubbed my eyes and wondered, why was I awake? I didn't feel the need to use the bathroom. But then I heard the sound of rustling. It was coming from the bushes just outside my window. I looked, terrified, toward the window. But at first, there was nothing there. I rolled over, facing the window, keeping an eye on it, until I eventually drifted back to sleep. But I was almost immediately interrupted. The rustling came again, louder than before. Tired, irritated, and a little bit creeped out, I crawled out of bed and walked over to the window. I began to sweat, and my eyes were watering. Outside, there was the creature, the same rotten clawed thing, same horns as before. It was the creature I had seen on my walk through the woods. I don't know what it was doing, but it was out there, just outside of our home. I ran to my bed and basically flew under my blanket. I hid there trembling, hoping that it hadn't seen me looking at it. It was the most scared I'd ever been. And I thank God I've never seen that creature again. The Predator of Shallow Water by Tristan I was about five years old when it happened. I'm sure most people would not remember too much from that age. So young. But this event is different. This event scarred me for the rest of my life. It happened in shallow water, Kansas, a very small town 
just outside of Scott City, where I was born. I was playing outside in my great-grandmother Ruth's backyard. It was a normal, beautiful day, almost perfect. The sky was clear, it was warm, and there was a slight, comfortable breeze blowing in. A nice Kansas day. Everything was going perfectly, until I looked toward the roof of the school nearby that was across the dirt road from my grandma's house. I looked up, just randomly, and perchance, I saw it, and for who knows how long, it had seen me. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm getting goosebumps just typing this up. The thing was standing on top of the school. It was about four or five feet tall, and it had large red eyes and very large wings. It looked like something straight from the bowels of hell. The wings were like those of a bat, and they were dark brown in color. The creature itself was all black, with a massive scar on its left leg, like it had been attacked before, maybe shot or sliced, and somehow the thought of that made it all the more terrifying. If you've ever seen the movie E.T., its head was similar to that. And as soon as it knew I realized it was watching me, it jumped down from the roof and began walking in my direction. It's hard to describe how petrified I was. It walked until it was about 30 feet from me. And at that time, I was crying, and I finally got the courage to stand up and run back to my grandma's house back to safety as fast as I could. But I know deep down, if that thing really wanted me, then I wouldn't be here to write this right now. I'm more than sure with wings that big, it could have been on me in moments, wrapping those clawed fingers around my small child's head, crushing it or dragging me away to never be seen again. As soon as I ran inside, tears flowing down my face, the adults asked me what was wrong, and I simply replied, I saw a predator. That's what I had decided to call it at a split second, the predator. I don't really remember why, but it just seemed like something you would call that thing. Several years later in my life, when I was 10 years old, my dad and I were talking about it. He said to me that it was not the first time he had an experience with what I called the predator. He told me that he had seen something once that perfectly matched the description that I gave him. He said he saw it, it took his dog and even a few cats when he was a teenager. He said that he had shot at it once but only managed to hit it in the leg with his hunting rifle before the thing flew off and away with one of his pets. I'm 17 now, and I'm so scared and paranoid of this thing that I outright refuse to go back to that town without a weapon. Nobody knows what it is, but I know that it is a carnivore and it takes small creatures with that being said, I'm lucky to be alive today because when I was five years old, I would have been the perfect size for a snack. If you ever visit shallow water Kansas, let me just warn you, don't forget protection. You never know when you may need it. Many of us have that creepy uncle. Maybe you are that creepy uncle. Author A.T. White tells us why you should even fear your own family. Now remember, I don't want you talking to him unless I'm around, you hear? Yes, Dad. I'm serious. Now tuck in your shirt. He's here. The front door swung open and there stood Uncle Tommy 
drenched in sweat from a day's work in the summer heat. It's a scorcher out there, ain't it? He said, putting his bag on the floor and untying his boots. I appreciate you letting me crash for the night. Just so long as you're gone in the morning, my dad replied coldly. Of course. Now, Uncle Tommy said, turning to me and lowering himself to a knee. Where's my hug at? Been a while since I seen you last. I took a couple of steps toward him and leaned in for a hug. Uh, his tight embrace made me uncomfortable and I let out a light whimper. Ah, <laughs> boy, don't you know it's a hundred degrees out there? He asked, tugging at my long sleeves. I haven't been outside today. I recited to him. Don't you have some chores to finish up? Dad interjected. I knew that was my cue to leave, so I shuffled off to my room. Later that night, I lay in bed. I tossed and turned, unable to get comfortable, when I heard the thud of footsteps in the hallway outside my bedroom. After several long seconds of silence, the door opened quietly. The dark silhouette of a man entered the room, and the door closed again. For several more seconds, there was nothing but unrelenting silence. I might have thought I had dreamt it all if it weren't for the sound of a hushed breath being carefully released. I could feel him getting nearer. The warmth of another person in the room was unfamiliar at this hour. I was not prepared for this. I prayed he would go away, to even come back in the morning if he must. He reached down and touched me. He rolled me onto my stomach and lifted up my shirt. From the corner of my eye, I could see two things the faint beam of a pocket flashlight, and Uncle Tommy's eyes studying my bare skin. His rough fingers ran up and down my back. Suddenly, he got up and walked to the bedroom door and left. I tried again to fall asleep, eventually succeeding. He was gone by the time I awoke, Around noon, the phone rang while my father was out. Hello, I said. Hey, buddy. Uncle Tommy? Yeah, your dad around? No, sir. Went to the store. Uh, good, he said, sounding a bit nervous. He paused for a moment. I'm calling about last night. I don't know if you were awake or not. I was, I replied. Well then, I'll just get right to it. I've got a question for you, and I need for you to be honest with me. Can you do that? Yes, sir. How'd you get all them bruises? The following is an allegedly true story of an encounter with strange creatures. Based on the author's description, it has been fully illustrated by Jorge Iracheta. If you like this video, be sure to spread the word and share with your friends, or send us your strange sighting stories at darknessprevails.org. Who knows, your experience might be the next to be fully illustrated. For more art by Jorge, or to hire him yourself, check the links in the description. Dakota T. shares his story of when he encountered the Beasts of the Rockies. No matter how much I wish it wasn't, this story is completely true. I wasn't drunk and I wasn't high on any drugs, neither was my friend, 
but I fear his state of mind might have been permanently altered due to his experience with these beings. Secondly, I like to consider myself a rational thinking type of person with years of experience hunting and hiking around my hometown in Wyoming. I've seen all kinds of fauna and flora, so I didn't confuse what I saw for something entirely different. It all started when I went to a friend's house to celebrate his birthday. He was turning 18 and I was already 18 myself. His uncle, a man more native to the land than myself, was 27. Let's call this friend James. I finally got to his house at about 4 p.m. that night. It was January 25th. Since he effectively lived in the middle of nowhere and at the foothills of the Rockies, I was keen on bringing something with me in case I ran into some trouble, like a bear or something of the like. So I brought along with me a 357 Magnum and some binoculars in case my friend wanted to try and hunt some coyotes with this 223 rifle. We started doing our normal routine for most of the day, playing games on his computer, watching some TV, and just chilling out and talking about school. His parents were away on a business trip to a nearby town, so they left James and his uncle the house to themselves. The thing that James loved the most in the world was easily his dogs. He had two chocolate labs and a golden retriever. The retriever was actually fairly old. This being Wyoming and people not really giving a hoot, the dogs were left out all day. They came and went as they pleased back to his house. Sometime around 8 or 9 p.m., we heard his dogs begin barking at something off in the distance. At this point, the sun was long gone, but the full moon gave an amazing amount of light. I looked through the nearby window in the direction of the dogs barking. Even with the moon shining against the snow, I could not see anything up to the tree line that was nearly a mile away. There's nothing there, I said. Are you sure? They don't even bark at deer anymore, James whispered to me. The whole situation was weird. Fast forward an hour, and his dogs have not been heard or seen since the barking started. His uncle was buzzed and watching something on their huge TV. James was beginning to worry that something happened to his dogs. Now, wolves can still be dangerous in the Rockies and they have no problem taking down a random dog that wanders into the woods. This is the moment where I started to get anxious, partly because he wanted to get his dog back and partly because wolves sometimes kill sheep or even cows. So if they were desperate, I'm sure they would have no problem with us. Even still, those dogs were his family. So we grabbed our guns and we headed outside. We were armed with heavy clothing as well as my 357, the binoculars, and his 223 rifle. We braced ourselves and we headed out into the Wyoming winter with temperatures 20 below freezing, going the direction of where we last saw his dogs. The whole time we walked toward the tree line, my veins were being flooded with adrenaline, the same feeling I got every time I hunted, but tonight we definitely weren't hunters. We were about 300 yards away from the tree line when James suddenly stopped. With my eyes trained on the ground and looking for signs of an animal, I almost ran into him. He just stared at the tree line. He kept whispering for me to look at the trees. Slowly, he raised his left index finger towards the foothills of the mountains. As soon as he knew I was looking towards the trees, he readied his rifle and pointed it towards them. I noticed at this point that his breathing was extremely rapid and raspy like he just witnessed a fatal car crash right in front of him. At that point, I honestly didn't know what he was talking about. I scanned the tree line over and over. I crouched down to sit on the snow. I used the binoculars towards where he pointed. It took me about 30 seconds, but eventually I saw what scared the hell out of him. There was something out there, and it wasn't human, and it wasn't his dogs. Something on four legs came out from behind a tree at the edge of the forest. It must have been about three feet tall at the shoulder. Of course, at first, I assumed it was a wolf or maybe even a small bear. A few seconds later, several more of these things came out of the woods. I didn't pause to try and count them, but there was at least six or seven, and who knows how many more were hiding in the trees still. We watched them slowly walk out of the trees for several minutes. These animals seemed strangely cautious or slow for whatever reason. Maybe they were scared of people. Then they eventually stopped 
as a howl from a dog or wolf came out from behind us. It was far enough away for us to not worry about it, but close enough for the unknown animals out there to hear the howl as well. I looked back through the binoculars and could almost make out the general texture of these creatures. They were now about 275 yards away. They looked pale and thin. They still appeared to be something like wolves or even large dogs. But my heart began to race when I saw what they did next. These things, whatever they were, picked up their pace fast, reaching speeds of what looked like 15 to 20 miles per hour judging from how fast they closed their distance to the direction of the howl. And coincidentally, this was almost right at us. After a minute or so, James lost it and tried to get up to run away. I grabbed him and threw him on the ground as he started to run, but this caught the attention of the beasts and they stopped. James and I, frozen with fear, sat down in the snow, weapons ready. I almost lost it as well, when I noticed that the eyes of these things reflected the moonlight, they were orange in color. They didn't really glow like in some stories of cryptids. They were more piercing. We stared at them and they stared back at us for what seemed like hours until one of these creatures stood up on its back legs. At this moment, all of my knowledge on hunting and animals was meaningless. I knew that some animals could stand up on their back legs but they could never do it very long. I audibly counted to see how long it stayed like that. Five seconds, 10, 15. Then James screamed and pointed his 223 to the right. I looked in his direction and I saw a creature on the left side of the group begin to get up and it ran away from the pack. Dumbfounded, I turned my attention to the rest of them and I told James to keep watching the one that ran away. I do a quick count of the ones that remained the ones that were staring us down. There were only four. My heart pounded out of my chest. There was no way we could have lost something so large on these plains. They're completely flat and covered in snow. I looked to our left and then I saw it. It was crouched down and trying not to be seen. I realized how smart these things were, much smarter than I would have ever expected. These things, they were flanking us. I whispered to James my suspicions of what's going on and he had the same thought. I made up a quick plan in my head and I relay it to James, our best course of action. I told him to start backing away slowly but to always maintain eye contact. As soon as I finish telling him my idea, I do another quick count. Now only three pairs of orange eyes. Another one went somewhere. The one that first stood was starting to walk towards us I helped James up and I told him to keep an eye on our right side while I looked to the left. We backed away, but these beasts walked with us, maintaining their distance the whole time. Eventually, we were only about 100 yards from his house before we turned and ran to his front door. We booked it towards his porch lights, no longer caring to be coy about the situation. Foolishly, I stopped 50 feet short of the porch and I turned around. Maybe it was curiosity I don't know, but I regretted it the moment I did it. My body seized up the moment I saw it. Those creatures stopped as soon as I made eye contact. With the creatures ever so slightly illuminated by the porch lights, I realized that these things seemed otherworldly. They were tall, probably six or seven feet, and they were insanely thin and lanky, almost like a basketball player. They were so pale and they stared right back with these intense orange eyes from before. I just looked back, less afraid, but more curious, and a few seconds later, James screamed. What are you doing? I pulled myself out of the weird trance I found myself in, and I sprinted towards his house. I jumped inside and bolted the door, all while his drunk uncle swore at us for making too much noise. I looked out of the windows with my gun in hand, but I didn't see a thing nothing but fresh tracks. I pulled the curtains back where they were and we heard the strangest noise, anything other than a person I've ever heard. It sounded like a dog's howl, but it repeated, almost like it was coming from a Siamong gibbet in repeated pulses in different pitches and tones. The uncle looked like he instantly sobered up after hearing it and he started locking all the doors and windows in the house. To our surprise, all of James's dogs were back 
that they were very frightened and confused, cowering in a corner. We watched through the windows for almost the entire night until I eventually needed to fall asleep, but we never had any other problems since. Whatever these things were, they were fast, they were smart, and they were nothing I've ever seen before. It looked like some strange dog man straight from tribal legend. I'm not a superstitious type of guy, but I hope it was somehow just a really elaborate dream, even if my friend and his uncle can recall the night too. I have no idea what we saw that night. I've searched everywhere for sightings or even myths around the area we saw it and have found nothing. But my husband and I think it could have been a Wendigo. My friends and I go camping a lot, and my favorite place is in Red River Gorge, Kentucky. We go there often, and I've been ever since I was an infant. I'm 28 now, married with a kid, and still go there. It is the closest place to where I live where you can see the Milky Way pretty much every night. It's perfect for stargazing, and I've seen a shooting star every clear night I've been there. When we go without our kid, we night hike to a good lookout point and stargaze for hours. Our first experience as night hiking, we would go to trails we knew well that were used frequently during the day ones with log fences and gazebo resting places. The most used trail is a trail in Natural Bridge State Park that leads up to the Natural Bridge. This trail is around two miles uphill, depending on your starting point. I've done this trail every summer of my life. I could do it blindfolded. It has wooden steps, carved rock steps, log handrails, multiple sitting points under a roof trash cans, but after reaching the main trailhead, it had no lights at all. It's used often, and while it is uphill, the difficulty is low. As long as you have good grip on your shoes and water, you'll be fine. My friends have done it with me multiple times and are confident in it as well. Hiking this trail at night is not allowed, but it is the woods and I've never really been one to care about closing times for the literal outside. When we used this main trail to hike to the top, we would park in a lot designated for the pool and Hoedown Island. You walk across the road that leads to the pool, and you're at the first trail marker. You go up gravel for a while and pass the Natural Bridge State Park Lodge. There's a waterfall and some lights, so it was best to go fast and watch out for rangers, who would tell us to leave. Then you walk across another road and there's a mini shelter to sit in, or a small rock wall to rest your legs. Then it's the beginning of the trail to the top. That night was weird to begin with. As soon as we started the hike, the clouds took over, and it appeared we'd be walking for nothing to even stargaze at. But we went anyway, just in case it cleared out by the time we got up there. In the beginning, it was just normal paranoia that was keeping us stressed and quiet, it seemed. You know you've reached the bottom of the bridge when you see a giant wall of limestone. During this time, there was a gazebo that set to the right of this wall, and the trail continued and followed next to the wall. Where you come from is a fairly steep part of the trail, and the gazebo was welcomed. My husband, my best friend at the time, and I all sat on the gazebo steps. The bench is under a roof, and even darker than the rest of the outside. So we just stayed on the steps. We were looking down the trail that follows the limestone wall. We each have a bright LED headlamp and a handheld flashlight. We don't usually look at each other when we night hike because the lights are so bright. We sat in a line like the Lord's Supper and walked in a line or staggered so we don't blind ourselves. It's after hours at this point 
No ski lift rides had gone up for hours, and the rangers had already done their sweep and had left right before we got out of the car to head up. We left no time between them making sure the trail and top were clear before starting our hike up. The ski lift takes you up to the top, but there are workers that stay and do counts and only leave after it's clear. I guess I have to make these points because that's what I was thinking when seemingly out of nowhere, this girl with a headlamp begins to walk down the trail we're looking out at. She's in a sundress and flip-flops. This hike is uphill, and while it is a fairly easy hike, it is not easy without water or real shoes. She'd have to have hiked up and down to this point with no food or water. Her light was bright, and when she reached where the trail turns from in front of the gazebo to down where we came from, she stopped. She just stood there straight on, like how a human is presented in an anatomical drawing. She was looking directly at all of us sitting there, and her light made me bring my hand up to shield my eyes. She didn't turn away from our lights at all, and she didn't even seem bothered that she had six LED lights aimed right at her face. I said, uh, Hello? She responded with a pause between every word, something like, Hello, how are you? I said something along the lines of, Uh, good, how are you? She took even longer pauses than before and said, Oh, I'm fine. She then just stood there, still with her hands to her side, and facing and staring at us. Her light made it impossible to really see her face, and it was so bright, I had my hand up the entire time, until she just turned and walked slowly down the trail, where we had just come up. She got to a part where the trail turned, and we saw her light just stay in that one spot for a minute, until she turned and the light faded out of sight. We waited for a while before continuing up. I kept making comments about how weird that was, but everyone else just made it out to me always being afraid. But no one ever came after her. She had done this hike alone, at night, and somehow without being found by any ranger. We got up after a bit and started back up to the top. It felt like it took much longer than it ever had in the past, but we made it to the top. There are stone steps named Fat Man Squeeze that get you to the top of the bridge and you can walk across it and whatever. Going up and being on the top, we could hear twigs snapping. We lay down and try to stargaze, but the clouds are even thicker now. It was miserably hot. We could hear voices at times, and my husband kept checking for people we heard. He never saw anyone. We saw a light flash, never saw anyone attached to it. But then we heard a bird call, but it wasn't like a real bird noise at all. It sounded like a person making bird calls, like rhythmic and not really natural. I was convinced we were not alone and had not been alone, but I was also the most easily spooked. I asked if we could leave as soon as they were ready to. They were ready right then and there, and that scared me that they were just as afraid as me at that point. We began going down the way we came. It felt like it was taking so long. We were going steady and quick. It was downhill, but we were not making any ground, it seemed. It's hard to explain, but it was so weird that at one point, I even said aloud, this feels much longer. And they agreed with me. 
I kept looking behind me with the flashlight, and my husband kept looking out to the sides. My friend kept hers mostly forward. I kept feeling watched. I could not figure out what footsteps were ours, or if they were all ours that I heard. I would turn in the direction of any noise, but not see anything. When my husband was walking, he kept saying he was catching eyes in his flashlight. Usually, you can catch raccoon eyes spying on you, or some animal like that. He was afraid it was a bear, or a large dog, or something, and he never got his lights on whatever eyes they were, long enough to see an animal size or shape. Now, we're hiking down semi-flattish area, at least compared to the downhill hike we'd been doing. The log fence or handrail or whatever it was called was on our right side. We're in a row walking within reaching distance of this barrier, and my husband just stops walking altogether and says, What's that? But the question is more of an alert. I move my lamp in that direction and don't see anything at first. Then both of his lights catch a shape, and then my headlamp catches it, and I move my hand lamp to center and catch it while my friend simultaneously finds it in her lights as well. All six lights, now shining onto and kind of reflecting off of a light, gray creature. It's bent in a crouching position, kneeling on its right leg, and starts turning towards us. It begins to slowly stand. My mind is racing still. It looks human, but it's too big. People mistake human shapes for what's actually bears in the woods often, but this thing was skinny. It was thin and big, and almost white it was so light gray, and its skin resembled dolphin skin. There was a shine to it. Our lights reflected a little off of it. It gradually comes to a full standing position in front of us. Its head is long, and its eyes are in a human position on the face, in front, and not on the side. But I could not see any other facial features, just big, almost empty holes or pits that were its eyes. It looked directly at us and our lights. The way it stood was intimidating, almost like when a snake raises up and flexes its neck all crazy to show prey that they're stronger, smarter. It was like it was stepping up to a fight, from crouching, then turning, then standing front on in front of us. The arms hung down low, and the hand seemed long too. Its hands had to be by its knees. I'd guess it stood nine feet or so, and not that far in front of us. No hair at all, and its head was large as well. I couldn't process what I saw, and I was frozen. Then I feel my husband hitting me on the back, yelling, Run, run, run! I start to understand we have to get away from this thing, and it pivots and runs to the right. It was going backwards on the trail, so it could get around the barrier and onto the trail behind us. We take off running the rest of the way down the trail, knowing that this thing just took off much faster than us, and after it had crossed from behind the barrier, it would be gaining on us quick. We didn't talk at all, because when we tried, it felt almost like we would get caught. We kept running as fast as we could, but some areas are so steep, it never felt like we were out of sight from that creature. As we made it to the trail beginning with the gravel, we could hear something to the side crashing down through the trees. We ran until we got to the car, and then we drove as fast as we could. As soon as we got to the main road, the sky cleared up, and the stars were out. When that thing looked at us, I knew it was smarter and faster than us. I knew that if we hadn't seen it, then it could have easily taken one of us and gotten away. I think the only reason it hesitated was because so many of us saw it at once, and we stayed together. When we made it back to where we were staying, 
all of us took out our phones and wrote a note for what we saw happen. We hadn't spoken about it until after we looked at each other's phones, and the stories were the same. Without a doubt, we had all seen something real. Is That a Werewolf? By Yona I live in Delhi, India. A couple of months ago, my best friend Varuna and I were sitting in our room studying for our upcoming finals. With only a couple of weeks left, we were extremely stressed and stayed up for hours that night to prepare. It was our college graduation exams and we both were pursuing the same subject, living in the same apartment complex and going to the same college. I've known Varuna since we were kids. We met during our kindergarten years, so we were quite close. So it was a long night of preparation and we were sitting in our living room studying. Our apartment was on the fifth floor, which faces a huge empty plot of land. The only trees present in that land are big coconut trees. The ground is full of tall grasses which cover up the land. There is a huge pond in the middle as well. When we first moved in, that piece of land was seriously spooky as there were no houses and there were tons of wild foxes that lived out there. We could hear them barking or screaming every night, which is pretty chilling the first time you hear it, but we both grew used to it. To separate the land from our complex, there was a huge six foot wall which prevents the foxes from coming in. From our living room terrace, we could see the foxes running around looking for food. It was around 2.30 a.m. and Varuna and I were chugging coffee and quizzing each other, and the foxes started howling and barking. We didn't pay attention to them, and instead tried to focus. Usually, they do this at intervals every night, so it was nothing new. However, this time, they didn't stop barking. Usually, they'd stop after maybe a couple of minutes, but they were at it for literally an hour. The complex is new and not many people live here, not to mention the street was pretty far away, so there was no noise from the vehicles or other people. That night, their continuous barking really irked us because we were trying to concentrate. To make matters worse, the stray dogs that lived around our complex began barking back at them. Our complex is full of them because it's still under construction and they get a lot of food from the workers and a few people that live here. We have two Labrador Retrievers as well, Danny and Drogo, yes, named from Game of Thrones. They rushed to the terrace and their back hair was standing up. We didn't pay them much attention at first, but after a while, we walked over to the terrace to bring them back in before they started barking like crazy. I got them on their leashes and tried to control them, afraid they'd take off or jump from the terrace. I got them back inside, then Varuna and I went back outside. We wanted to know if there was something they were all barking at to see if it wasn't just some argument between the foxes and dogs. At first, we saw a few foxes running around. Then suddenly, we saw a massive figure standing up from the ground. Honestly, I thought it was a person at first, but then it stood up and it appeared to be holding something in its mouth something that I soon realized was the body of a fox. We stood there staring at it without making so much as a whimper. That's when our dogs decided to empty their lungs at this thing. The creature turned at us, glaring at us, and I could see it had a long snout, shabby, rusty gray hair and pointed ears. Its eyes held such a malicious gaze and looked almost silvery in color. It looked like it was breathing heavily and growling at the same time. We watched it pull the fox from its mouth with an especially sharp, clawed hand. What on earth are we looking at? Varuna basically screeched beside me, digging her nails into my arms and breaking me out of my shock. The beast turned, got down on the ground and began running. We could see it going further away as it broke the grass and trampled on it, running at full speed. We were soon left standing there, staring into a now empty field. The dogs had stopped barking 
and were now nuzzling my leg, trying to get my attention. I noticed their tails had been tucked under their bodies. We went to the rooms and started closing the windows and pulling the curtains back. I've never been so scared in my life. Even though we saw the thing run away, we were sure it'd be back, especially with all the foxes in that field. We switched off the lights and sat on the sofa, not really speaking for a long time. We could still hear the distant barking and howling of the foxes, but they soon gave up as well. We fell asleep on the couch that night together and woke up quite late. Varuna was still shaken up by the experience and wanted to go investigate, but I didn't want to go out there, daylight or nighttime. What if that thing came back and we were there? We waited for two weeks to see if it would come back, but we never saw it again, and I can't be any more thankful for that. I Survived the Dogman by Unnamed Hunter. The incident occurred in November of 2015, the week before Youth Weekend in Vermont. I went out alone with my hatchet, machete, and water. That's it. I thought myself a self-made survivalist, and I was either too young or too dumb to know any better. I didn't know how truly dangerous the wilderness could be. To set the scene for you, I was alone in 110 acres of woods. I stupidly chose to go to the thickest section. I walked out to an area of spruce trees that had a decent amount of deer activity, and once I got to the location, I got to work making my deer blind using dead falls and spruce bows. I was making a lot of noise with my hatchet, cutting logs to make the three walls to lean the spruce bows on. That's when I thought I heard a stick snap behind me. I stopped and slowly turned to see what had made the sound. When I turned around, I saw that I was still alone, although I did notice that the woods around me had gone unnaturally quiet. I was too inexperienced to know that that was a bad sign. I went back to work, and the same snaps kept happening moving around the side of me. That's when I heard a guttural growl, a snarl. I turned and saw huge dog-like legs with claws or nails that were at least three inches long. I looked up, trembling as I took in the sight. Not even 15 feet away from me was the largest dog or wolf-looking thing I'd ever seen. And what really disturbed me was the way it had a human expression upon its face, baring its teeth in a chilling-looking smile. I was dumbfounded. All I could think to do was keep my eyes on it and slowly back away. I did exactly that, and it did the same, mirroring my movement, but coming closer, not backing up like I was. It only stopped when I made it to the edge of the woods. I do not know why it didn't follow me out, why it didn't end me when it had the chance, because it easily could have at any moment. These days, I don't do my hunting or surviving out in those woods anymore, and if you go out in the woods yourself, I don't recommend you go unless you go well-armed. Werewolf in the Barn by Skylar H. I lived in South Minnesota on a private property and farm country. The property was rather large and heavily wooded in most parts. There was also a small pond and steep stream bed. It was the beginning of November when I had my encounter with this monster. My wife and I had just finished cleaning up after our yearly Halloween party. We had invited the entire family out and set up a haunted trail that the younger people in the family could enjoy. It was two days after the party had happened. It was about 8.50 p.m. We had finally finished storing all the decorations, and we also moved our five horses up to the main barn 
from their lockout pasture. We had put them down there so we could use the main pasture for the trail. The horses did not make it very easy though. They bolted as soon as we opened their gate. This wasn't usually like them. We basically had to run the mile uphill to catch up. We set out fresh hay and locked them in since there was going to be a hard freeze that night. I had just put dinner in and was enjoying some television when my phone got a text message in the kitchen. I lazily got to my feet when I heard the horses going crazy in the barn. I figured one of the farm dogs had gotten locked in with them. They do prefer to sleep on the hay instead of our carpet. I grabbed my spotlight and I walked down to the porch. Surprisingly, I found all my dogs there, all of them staring at the barn. I shined the light down into the lockout pasture and saw the horses all on one side of the corral. They were also staring at the open barn door. At that point, I was still assuming they had gotten spooked by something small, maybe a bat flying around or a tool falling off the wall. I yelled back to my wife who was upstairs. Something spooked the horses. I'm gonna go round them up. Can you help out? It took her a minute to reply saying that she'd be out in a few. I called for the dogs to come with me and started for the barn. I walked into the barn pasture and the horses immediately trotted to crowd around me, almost pushing me over. I yelled and they backed off, giving me some space. My wife's mare, Cherry, kept rubbing her muzzle against me, eyes wide and terrified. I grabbed a nearby stool and brush and began to pat her backside, which is something she enjoyed, and I was trying to calm her down real quick. And that's when I noticed the four long parallel slashes going down her leg. I immediately thought there was a bear, and I shone the light into the barn. Besides a few tools and some buckets thrown around, there was nothing. I figured if there was a bear, it had smelled some of the garbage left in the upper level from the party. I was about to start to lock the horses back up when I noticed a bale of hay lying on the floor, twine still on it. It was not there when I locked them up. I went rigid and shone my light up to the loft, expecting to see a black bear, but I could only see the first couple of feet of the loft, so I had to climb up. I walked over to the ladder and noticed some dark gray hair hanging on a nail about halfway up. Right before I was about to climb up, I heard my wife behind me start to scream, along with the horses whinnying. I spun around to see her shining her own light upward to the top of the barn. The window, she said. Drawing my courage, I climbed up the ladder, and I looked toward the window. It wasn't a bear. At first, I thought it was one of my younger relatives pulling a prank on me, but when the creature opened its mouth and started to pant like a dog, I knew it was no prank. It was about six feet tall and at least 200 pounds, halfway through the window of the barn loft. It was dark gray with a lighter shade around its neck. Its head was very similar to a German Shepherd, but with a much larger muzzle. And its eyes, the closest I can describe them in color would be beer, but like someone was showing a dull yellow light through it. Those eyes were locked on me, mouth still open revealing sharp and jagged teeth, stained light brown. It was almost leaning out of the window, one hand resting on the side, its hands resembled almost a raccoon's hands with long bony fingers and sharp claws. I slowly climbed back out of the barn and I made my way to my wife. There we could still see this thing, now on the other side of the window staring out. My wife was about to scream again, but I shot my hand back and covered her mouth. She immediately grabbed my arm and clung to me. The creature put both hands in the window while I leaned down and whispered to my wife. On three, we run and we don't look back. Before I could finish this sentence, the creature had jumped down and went to all fours growling, and we simply bolted. We ran the 25-yard gap between the house and barn in record time. 
The dogs had all run back to the deck and were now growling and baring their teeth at the thing. My wife reached the door first and flung it open, but when she turned to me, she screamed. I risked it, glancing back behind me and saw that the thing was terribly close, less than 10 feet. I reached the front steps and jumped as hard and as far as I could, and thankfully landed inside with the dogs right behind me. My wife slammed the door and was then thrown back as the door was flung back open, the thing standing up and staring down at us, baring its teeth. It wasn't all the way in, though. I jumped up and placed all my weight into the barely open door. It shut and latched, but I soon felt something heavy outside slamming its weight against the door, and I heard the wood begin to crack. My wife thankfully had recovered and rushed to my side to set the lock in place. We then left the entryway, locking every door we saw, and ran into our kitchen. The only window there was a small one above the sink, which we hid under, hopefully out of sight of the thing. We huddled there for three hours, waiting and listening. Each of our dogs were set in different entryways and other rooms, all observant and waiting as well. We heard each one growling, one after the other, as if something was outside the house, walking around. Not too long after that, we heard the horses whining, followed by a loud crash. I figured they had broke down the gate and had escaped back into the pasture. We felt relieved until one of the dogs bared its teeth a moment later, and the assault on our house continued. Eventually, around midnight, when things settled down, the dogs no longer bared their teeth. We went to the bedroom, shut all the curtains, and locked the doors. We tried to sleep, but every little sound outside made me jump, and my wife was worried about our horses. Just when the sun began to rise, we managed to fall asleep. When we woke up, we immediately got dressed and went to check on the horses. They were all fine, scared, but fine. We patched up Cherry, my wife's mare, with her deep, gashed cuts. We went over to the barn door to see what needed fixing but what we saw surprised us. The latch to the barn door had been undone and flipped up. The way a person would open it, no animal could do that. I realized this thing must have been quite intelligent, which made it all the more horrifying. That day we went into town. We got a deadbolt for the barn, and we went to a sporting goods store and bought a gun. After that night, we didn't have any more encounters, unless you count the horses refusing to leave the barn a few weeks later. I asked my nearby neighbors if anything strange had happened on their properties, but no one had any problems, except for one of them. The one was a few miles south of our property. When I asked what happened, all he told me was that they lost a stallion a few weeks prior to my encounter. I asked him if he saw anything, and he gave me a funny look. He said it looked like a bear got at it, real bad. Tore up his stallion real good. I wondered if he was hiding something, hiding a story that he thought others wouldn't believe. But I didn't push the subject any further. Since then, I can't look at the woods the same way anymore. If these things are out there, who knows what else is? I don't feel safe going fishing, camping, or even horseback riding anymore but I will say this to you. If you're outside at night, always watch your back. Dogman by Haley. I was at a bus stop waiting for the bus to get me. It was very dark outside and there was no light. So I had turned on my phone flashlight hoping I wouldn't be passed up by the bus. I waited a good 10 minutes before I saw it. I began waving my light in the direction of the driver, hoping they would see me, but they did not, and I ended up getting passed by. <sighs> Knowing that my house was about a mile or two down the road, I started to run down the road, and as I was running, I heard something that made me pause only for a moment, a screaming howl not like any wolf or dog I'd ever heard. 
It was terribly close, too. My heart started beating faster than it ever had before, and I was running with tears coming down my face, but I had no intention of stopping. The road I was running down was lined with thick trees on each side. My panicking anxiety made it seem like the trees were closing in on me, but I knew they weren't, and I tried to remain calm. The screaming howl came again, and it was getting closer. I wasn't sure if I was running to it, or if I was being chased by something. Once I had reached the house, it looked like nobody was home. My parents do not keep the front door unlocked, so I had to run around to the back, but I could not get into that door either. My heart was pounding. All I could do was wait, and pray that the howling would stop. Soon, I heard my parents arrive home, and I ran to the front door. I found them in the living room. They'd brought home some food, and they had started eating. I interrupted them, explained the noise that I had heard, and I was wondering if they'd seen anything on their way here. They both looked at me confused, and my dad said they hadn't seen anything, but I was welcome to check the front yard. I was standing on the front porch, too anxious to eat. I was scared, but also extremely curious. Whatever was out there, whatever I had heard, I wanted to see it. It was like I couldn't feel better about the situation unless I did see the thing. And as I stood there waiting for any movement in the dark, I saw what appeared to be a person walking toward our house. But as it got closer, I saw how far from human it was. It had very long, tall, thick legs, extremely long, sinewy arms that hung down to its knees. Its shoulders were hunched over, and the closer it got, the faster its speed picked up. When it was all too close, I turned and ran inside. I sat down quickly by my mom, getting close to her side. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I was panicking so much. As she was trying to comfort me, we began to hear scratching along the walls of the house, like it was coming from the back end. When I stood up to look out the window behind my dad, I saw two of the same figures walking around the house. My family went quiet for a while, until the scratching went away, and I could no longer see the silhouettes walking around outside. I remember my dad saying, Did you, did you see how big those were? To this day, he believes that they were just dogs or maybe bears, but I'd seen one up close, and I'd have to disagree about that. My family is planning on moving into a more secluded area near a lake, and I can't help but feel a bit nervous about living even deeper in the wilderness. The Summer Monster by Jared I lived in mid-Michigan, not the ghettos part, although I do live very close to a few hotspots. No, I live in a more rural part, the part of Michigan that's flat farmland with large patches of forest, where the DNR is constantly receiving stories of weird animals. The latest is an out-of-place big cat, or cats, I should say, jaguars and panthers, but that's not what I'm here to talk about, even though I wish it was. It began around the mid-90s. It was a warm summer when I began to see something stalking the roads and forests. My first encounter was in fifth grade. Before then, I was always really sick as a kid, so I was never outside too often. As I got older and stronger, I began faring much easier with the outside world. On my parents' property, we have tons of feral cats, close to a dozen on average, and of course, they all have kittens, pretty much. At the time, I had a big collie named Barney, who has sadly since passed away. Barney absolutely loved to cuddle the kittens regardless of their age, meaning the kittens would go into shock being stolen from their mom by this giant ball of love. We'd have to go outside and take the kittens from the poor dog and give them back to their moms which was usually pretty easy, but not that summer. On that day, it had happened again. I went outside our house and began to look for the cats. 
I got around to the back of the place by our barn, and around a hundred feet or so, I could hear what sounded like snapping. Not like twigs snapping, but corn stalks. I looked up past our barn to the field by my house and saw this huge black shadow, clearly heavily covered in matted fur, tearing through the field towards me. I was frozen. I've never seen this before. I mean, I've watched spooky shows and even been into cryptozoology my whole life, but nothing prepares you for something like this. Once the fear kicked in and I decided to make a break for it, I ran full speed back to the house. By the time I got inside, my parents were terrified. They knew I'd seen something and they began to console me. See, they knew I saw something because a large unknown animal had attacked my mom while she was outside a few summers before that, back when it first started showing up. She said she had run inside after feeling a very bad feeling, only to suddenly have a giant animal trying to break in through our front door. Fast forward around a week or two later, my mom and I were both back outside, the same deal. Missing kittens with the big cuddle dog. This time, we barely made it back to the door. My flashlight went past our barn towards the woods behind the house. A neighbor had an old derelict truck there, and horrifyingly, I saw something standing beside it. I mean, standing too, like it was taller than the top of the truck. I saw these giant glowing eyes, I don't remember much about color. I want to say red or orange, but that was so long ago, and I was too scared to look any further. My mom suddenly grabbed me. We raced back to the house and quickly locked the door, making sure to put as much space between us and that thing as possible. I'm an adult now, but I still see things like it around. I used to have a room upstairs in my house, but now I sleep in the basement. One big factor for that move was because some nights I could hear crunching outside, like something heavy walking on pebbles, followed by slow breathing and shallow growling as something stood up right by my window. Then there were the screams coming from the woods, something that still freaks me out when I hear it. It's kind of like a kid screaming, but throw in some bass and make it more feral. It always gets all the dogs in the neighborhood barking, even though none of us are too close to each other. And the thing has a smell, like rotten lettuce and decaying possum. The smell of it comes far before the thing ever shows up. I learned really quick to be careful and wary outside. Just because we've developed society and civilization doesn't mean there still aren't very dangerous animals out there most of which, if you don't see it first, you'll never see it until it's too late. What could it have been? From Hanny23 I was around 11 or 13 at the time. I would always love to go into the woods to just have some fun with my cousins, but sometimes I would stay in my backyard Sometime in the middle of June that year, something happened that would change the way that I saw those woods. I was attempting to stay the night in my treehouse. It must have been only a few hours until dawn at the time. The treehouse is located at the edge of the woods, and I was alone at the time, or so I thought. I climbed into the treehouse and looked out the window. It was then that I realized I was pretty thirsty so I decided to go down and walk towards my house. Around that time, I got this feeling that someone or something was watching me. I ignored it and thought it was at most some wild animal. I made it into my house and grabbed my bottle, which had some Yoohoo in it, which was my favorite drink as a child. As I exited the house, I noticed that our old blonde lab had followed me. He was a good dog. I gave him a quick pet, then went on my way to the treehouse. As I entered the treehouse, I looked out the window, glancing back in the direction of my dog. 
I noticed that he was no longer watching me. He was instead staring into one particular part of the woods. I'd never seen my dog do that before. If there was something that piqued his interest, he would go check it out. I'd never seen him just stay still like that, as if he was scared. But then, he began to make this low, deep growl. I called out to him. Rocky, what do you see, boy? He turned to look up at me, but only for a split second, then went right back to staring at that spot in the woods. It started to rain and thunder, but along with those sounds came another, a sort of humming that was coming from my right. Immediately, I felt scared, chilled to the bone. I looked out the window that was facing the direction of that sound. I saw it, something that horrified me, that didn't make sense. A creature that I'd never seen or heard of before. It was standing at the forest floor and was a little too close to the treehouse. It was big, skinny, brown. It was looking up at my treehouse with reddish brown eyes. I thought to myself, do I run to the house or do I stay up here? I crouched beneath the window so that it could not see me and I decided to stay until morning. The next day, I hurried down the treehouse and began to run as fast as I could out of the woods. After that incident, I didn't want to go into the woods ever again, because whatever that thing was could still be lurking out there, waiting for its next meal. Finally, deer season. I've been waiting ages. I'll just get this new trail cam set up. I'll be back tomorrow with my bow. Hello? Is someone there? Uh, I guess it was nothing. I hear something. Of course, just the wind. Ah, uh, geez. There hasn't been a single deer all week. I haven't seen a single living thing, for that matter. I'm just gonna call it a day. Uh, what? Something must have torn it from its place. I'll just put it up here. Not the same spot, but maybe it'll see something. It's so quiet, almost like all the wildlife just up and went, disappeared. Get out! What was that? Great, now I'm starting to hear things. Uh huh. That noise. It's coming from over here. What? That's weird. I thought I left this on the tree. That's not possible. There's no way I forgot that I brought it back. Let's see what the SD card has to say about that. Nothing out of the ordinary. What the? <laughs> Little T.
Timmy is scared. He thinks there is a monster in his closet. Usually he calls for his parents and asks them to check his closet. But there would be nothing there. Timmy's parents don't answer his call. That's because... They're with me.